Crouch. Find. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, Season 3. We're back. Six Nations is back. Joining me is a back in Alex Good. And Shady's back. It's Sean <laughs> O'Brien. Um, gents, just on the first glance, what on earth are you wearing? I am wearing my London Irish training vest. Sleeveless. Sleeveless. Guns out, sun's out, guns out. But 8 a.m. and you've got your guns out. Nice. Yes, because I'm going training, Alex. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Alex, talk us through your, your t shirt. Yeah, can you see? Can you see it? I don't know if Nervous. you can see. Oh, we can see our it. Fully, yeah. yeah. Um, so, our fullback, Yoshi, uh, our fullback, he is uh, head of merchandise, I believe, his official role at the club. Um, it's his job. And for some reason, he just um, decides to go and get t shirts and earmuffs and <laughs> stuff and just put his face on the. The t-shirts, so yeah, you just get given these t-shirts, or um, sometimes earmuffs are just left on my peg, and uh, you have to pay for them or golf balls. I'd like the earmuffs. Can you can you post me the earmuffs? No, this is lime green though. This is the only thing we have is our match shirt and this. Everything else is more normal colours, really. I'm sorry to disappoint. Yeah, but it's got his face on it. I like yeah, it. Well, I like I it. it. I... Yeah. He's, he's done well. I, I mean, like his it. job is to yeah. basically promote his image. So, you know, do you know, can't knock do you know it. there is T-shirts out there that people like put their best friend's image just on their T-shirt. And then when you're stopped or you're chatting to a different someone who doesn't know you quite well, they go, who's who's that, by the way, on your, on your T-shirt? And you go, that's my best friend, James. <laughs> or, that's my, or that's my best friend, Alex. And <laughs> they just go, where, where, where are you going, Sean, with this, mate? <laughs> you're just filling the air. Stop talking. Honestly. Honestly, there's people now that are putting their best friend's faces under on their, on their T-shirts. Is this you saying you want to get my face on your T-shirt? Do you want me to get a picture of me for you, mate? Is that I what actually you want? would like that, to be honest with you. Do you think we should get some House of Rugby merchandise and see who's the best seller? I'm, I'm not included oh, in this, thank you. I'm talking about, it. obviously, the... It depends if it's like Sean's book or not, because it could be a massive failure or a massive success, really. Oh. <laughs> How did Sarri's get on the weekend, by the way? <laughs> uh, we, we lost again uh, 59 points to 31 uh, we are the entertainers of the league but I have been following religiously the NEC Green Rockets okay three losses unfortunate a lot of tries scored a lot of tries scored for three losses can't say it was the happiest day you know, lo you know losing and letting in 59 points is, is not ideal uh, but um, yeah we scored five tries so um <laughs> We're trying to chuck the ball around. I will say, though, we played at the uh, Kichibu, I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, stadium, and it was awesome. Like, middle of Tokyo, you're five minutes from Shibuya, um, people can roll in with drinks, um, good crowd out, beautiful weather. Um, really was a, a nice, nice to have fans there and uh, people enjoying themselves at my expense. OK, well, I'm delighted to say our first guest is somebody who played international rugby for Australia, but is actually probably an awful lot busier since he decided to hang up his boots. It's the original, is it the original? We'll soon find out. Honey Badger, Nick Cummins. Nick, welcome. G'day, guys. How are you tracking? Now, I think I've probably met about a three Aussie athletes who are called the Honey Badger. So are you the original Honey Badger? Yeah, there's been a fair few popping up. Um, you know, good on them. They're uh, they're trying to really get a mug sitting. Uh, you know, I get a couple of blokes actually come up to me, say if I'm at the pub or something, they come up and they go, "Oh, mate, I um, th th this girl thought I was I was the honey badger, so I went with it, and uh, yeah, it worked." And I went, "What do you mean it worked? <laughs> what what happened?" <laughs> anyway, I won't go into the story, but it was quite successful. Um, good luck to oh. it. Maybe that will help Sean. Sean, that might help you with your day today. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm he... fine. I'm perfectly oh, okay at the minute. Really? Perfectly okay. Sean, Sean would be known as the money badger because busy that's enough. all he ever goes on about. I'm busy enough. I'm busy enough. I'm yeah, oh, busy. Yeah. Yeah, okay. With that haircut, fair play. <laughs> I can't. I can't wait for the barbers to open. <laughs> but when I do, I'll be looking well again. Yeah, because you were an oil painting before, mate. Jesus, you're. Are you, when, when, did you, when, did you, when did you? When did you? When did you become a male model? We've got somebody <laughs> on from Australia, and you two are just talking between yourselves. Ah, oh, just just want to get a bite out, Sean. Yeah, it's a go. Um, you're trying. All right, so we this bit might stay in, or or it might not. That's this is exactly <laughs> Nick why we do not do this live. However, <laughs> what I do want to know is how well, if at all, you guys all know each other, because I know that Sean. And Nick, you have played against each other 
Have you ever, apart from playing no, against like, Cody? No, we kept, we kept everything professional. Um, we didn't take anything, um, you know, we've, I'm straight. Um, and, yeah, I, we've... We've kept it like that, I think, for on my side anyway. Yeah, hundred percent. The only thing I remember of Nick in, was uh, scoring under the post with a big dive um, in the Viva Stadium, and and then um, actually, I think he was a part of the. You can actually tell the story if you want, Nick. The the Dublin Six. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one, for of, the one viewers, of the one, one of the Dublin Six. <laughs> <laughs> one of the originals. Oh, Struth or Marty, that was um, that was a biggie actually. So we got over there to to Iron, and he, you know, to see me relos. It was going to be a great old weekend. Um, anyway, on the we had the Tuesday hard training session. We had Wednesday off, and we thought we'd do a little team bonding. So we ducked out on a on a buddy Tuesday night team dinner, a couple of problem solvers um, with the boys, and then um, all of a sudden, yeah, look, I mean, we had Wednesday off, and we needed it to come together. You know, get tight get tight and um we, we we did that and all of a sudden you know a couple more and then your buddy uh, you're at the pub and and you know yeah sure things can like drag on a little bit and you can have a bit of fun boys get excited happens time to time anyway we buddy get back and and there's a big drama there was some uh <laughs> someone got carried into the hotel either way we had a good night <laughs> <laughs> and and we um and we got absolutely roasted our, our own like establishment um buddy just threw us under the bus massively i mean it would be handled very differently if it was the all blacks they they're very good about how they do it they'll in house they'll they'll discipline their their lads and and you yeah. can see like they they don't ruin the sport you know in, in the in new zealand because it's so well respected people the players are respected but they're also like, harshly punished but internally you know, uh, we we were thrown out of the bus, and there was a buddy on the newspapers. There, there was this a uh, front page buddy article. It was all the, called the Dublin Six, and we had all the our, our bodies were there. Oh no, our faces were on the bodies of the um, the hangover in the movie The Hangover. It had all those characters <laughs> with our faces. A, a lot of it was buddy. It was a crack and buddy. I'm gonna go find that. That was a belter. Yeah, but, and um, the big question is: the big question is, did you end up in Copperface Jacks that night? Bloody oath, we did. Well, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Had an absolute blast. That's a cra- that's a good spot, eh? Um, it's, probably not. Uh, it's a wild ideal. spot. That is. That's all. Probably. That's full of country people. Yeah. See, that's probably why we enjoyed it. You know, it's it's mm. it's one of those things where, yeah, sure, I get it. You know, it's, it's professional setup, and and you got to keep a lid on it. But what happened that weekend is we came out, and I think we put a record score on that weekend. Um, so obviously the the, the, bond, the bond, uh, team bonding actually worked. <laughs> and um, yeah, we, we had, a, had a bloody great time. Nick, in terms of how you got involved in rugby, you know, you come from a big family. Do you come from a sporting family? I do, yes, yes. So me old boy and mum, both real sporty. Dad was sort of the... Uh, more the, the brawn and mum was, uh, was the brains. Um, don't know how that relates to me, but... I think what being being one of eight kids is a is an interesting one. You get a lot of uh, competition when growing up, whether it's for not not for tucker. You know, there's always there's enough tucker for everyone, but it's more like if someone's got something something good on their plate, you know, and then that, the younger kid, you know, he's got he's got a bit of meat that you want. You you know, you're pointing over there, so they look over there and you switch you switch your buddy, <laughs> you know, some shitty veggies over with some good ones, and then all of a sudden your buddy, you're happy days, but. No, it was it, it was awesome. It was awesome growing up. It was a very very different to the majority of people. But I don't know over in Ireland there. What what's the standard? What how many in your family, mate? I had two brothers, two sisters. Yeah. I was. They used to call me the dustbin actually because <laughs> I used to the same thing. Anything that was left on the plate, I I had it I had it gone in two seconds. But yeah, some fight. There was always a few rows and fights over food in our house. To be fair, um, but uh, it's all good fun though. You'd have you, you'd have you'd have your mom. My mom used to go run around the kitchen with a wooden spoon, trying to <laughs> hit us a few belts of it, <laughs> to try and get us to calm down. I actually remember one day, my uh, my older brother was there, and she broke a wooden spoon across him, and uh, he started laughing at her, which absolutely drove her insane. And she she got another wooden spoon and gave, broke that across him, 
I swear to God, I thought she was after buying 20 wooden spoons because I think she <laughs> broke seven and then she was all out and she gave up then. She gave up straight away. It was one of the things actually I was uh, talking to my brother a few weeks ago about. Uh, we were laughing about it again. Yeah, the w- wooden spoon story. That's the but, best. Um, I, I only had two, seven's a lot. I only had two, two breaks on me, though, which, which was bloody. I was a good boy, mate. But yeah, it was <laughs> one, of the, one of the things when, you, when the tucker's there too and you got your arm over like around your tucker there and then your plates in between your arm and your and your mouth so it's <laughs> and then you've got this arm as is good for for blocking or stabbing with a fork if, you, if you're coming in too hot alex yeah. alex wouldn't have had that nick um um with with the way he was over in england it would have been like yeah. he just would have been told off from a distance saying, <laughs> he was fed yeah, yeah, so you've yeah. been a naughty boy alex Go to the yeah. corner and sit there and behave yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the stabbing action, to be honest. It was all about the fork, mate. I drew blood on my yeah. brother once and uh, he, ended up, he ended up chasing me up the stairs and giving me such a hiding that he was uh, rubbing my face on the carpet until I had like a burn down my face, to be honest. Oh, so, yeah. You yeah. really forked him up. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> see, what you done, see what you've done there, mate. <laughs> um... So we were finding out, Nick, uh, Alex's stories from Japan, and there always seems to be quite a lot of stories uh, from Japan. You played some rugby over there. Did you enjoy that experience? Oh, it was a, it was something different, eh? Holy truth. <laughs> like, it, I was shocked at just, um, and I, I love the Japanese boys. They're, they're honourable. They, they're courageous. They'll throw throw themselves into it, any problem in, on a, in the field, like in a game, and will knock themselves out, no dramas. And... Um, and then they'll back back up and into it again. They're, they're very very funny, especially when you get out and on the uh, on the source with them for another uh, team bonding session, or whatever else. Remember one time we were all in there on the sake and we're at buddy legs crossed in these buddy on the bamboo floors and the and I, I can't sit all that for that long. I'm buddy moving around. I got buddy worms and these bugs are all sitting there and we're just necking these um these little sake shots. Anyway, in about probably just before midnight, they were all nude. And and the team doctor was was doing this awful dance while naked, and it, I was just I was having the best time. It was a great great night. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. They're not afraid of a bit of nudity, that's for sure. I think the no. uh, onsen experience hit me, and then the changing rooms. And any time mm. there's a drink, they just get naked, and they no, yeah. no worries about it either. Like they're very happy for everyone to to see them. Is you know good confidence. Yeah, it they're is. Isn't it? Their own bodies. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, yeah. I, I know what you said that on send. Bloody hell! I'll, you know, it's definitely a confidence booster if you want to. Um, if you want to get over there and build yourself up, you just march into the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you walk, I'm walk, you... It's like one of those old westerns. You know, you walk in the door and the and the, and the doors go. They sort of swings open like that, and you sort of walk in. Everything goes. Music sort of stops, and everyone sort of looks at you like that. And obviously, you know, you've you've you've, uh, you've warmed yourself up, you're packing heat, and then, yeah, the rest is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you right there, Lee? You just imagining the onsen, or Lee is thinking about you now coming through the double doors, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do they get naked out in public, like in public bars and stuff like that, or is it just is this all in house stuff, like? Uh not not so much in public bars. Yeah. Like, yeah, in, like, like if they're having a party in a bar like and things kick just off go to the and pub. at the end of the night everyone's no. running around with nothing on them mm. no it's not 6pm um, first pint and they get naked it's not quite yeah, like that no, no, no. if it's like a team party or a team event it's just nudity happens quicker than you'd imagine if you're away at a camp you know if you're away at a camp and the hotel has uh, you know a, a function room in there for that camp like that would be yeah flat out go for goal you know like, not, not in public but in public. Yeah, because you've got to save face for the company. You can't be getting naked in public with your, like, for me, NEC kit, kit on. That would be really frowned upon. Yeah. Did, uh, did they love you over there, Nick? Did they embrace you, like? It was bloody awesome, yeah. I, I, I was uh, Badgesan. Badgesan was my name. <laughs> Badgesan. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, they always throw a sign at the end of, of, uh, yeah. of someone's name. We learn a little bit, they don't... Just enough to uh, order a feed and whatever else, but and introduce yourself. But um, yeah, outside of that, mate, we had a, had a little translator who would bring him out, and it was bloody unreal. We get amongst it. But Nick, you've played your rugby in some 
quite uh, diverse countries and countries that aren't exactly known for rugby. Tell us about Norway. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, the Nords, so good. My brother is the captain coach of, um, of Norway. He was uh, for, for league and union. I used to cruise <laughs> over there and uh, play a couple of games. I'm actually looking in, we're meant to be going, I think it's the end of this year, we're going over again. I'm going to go, it's a, it's a rugby league tournament. So I'll be, I'll be getting amongst that for sure. Wow. It's, it's it's the best. I, I just think that country is is a, amazing for many reasons. Um, but you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a, in a relationship. Um, yeah, happy relationships, and that's all great. Um, but going over there, <laughs> so and, happy. And the, and I'm very the, excited about that. Yeah, and the, I am, mate. Hundred percent. And, uh, and yeah. the, you know, I'm not sure what the relevance to the story in I, Norway. I was but... thinking when you were talking about the country, I was like, because you like the great outdoors and things, not everything else that you're obviously alluding to hot women in fairness to them they're absolutely like norwegian girls to look at are incredibly good looking birds yeah i was talking yeah. about the countryside but yeah i mean that's probably true too yeah. um, <laughs> <but>. <laughs> the, tan- the tangents here are just everywhere i just thought you were really proud that you've got a girlfriend you seem so proud of the fact that you found one and you're like yeah i've got a girlfriend now so thanks yeah, for no, it's that's that's it. very ha- we're very happy for you but get back let's get back to norway yeah, righto. Anyway, so we get over there to Norway and we well, bloody, my, my old man came, brought his boots, so he ran on, my brothers ran on, um, and then, yeah, we all just ran on and had a game for, for Stavanger. So it's Stavanger, uh, Stavanger, at Investor Nordiga is Stavanger. So it's one, one, of, one of my enjoyable experiences over there in different countries playing footy. You get to learn the different cultures and share what, what, we've, what you've experienced in those other countries. Share that with the, with the new folk and they love it too. Is rugby big over there? No, not at all. <laughs> but it's uh, it's great. That's what makes it fun, you know. It's extra fun. And why is your brother over there working? Like he he actually lives over there and coaches these sides. Yeah, he's yeah he's um, married to a Viking woman, and he's uh, he's got a little hybrid child, little little half Viking, half Australian. <laughs> And uh, that yeah, he's he's married and and loving it over there. Yeah, he's, he's he does miss the Aussie summers, but he'll um he'll be back soon enough. In terms of rugby, something that we've talked about, we've had lots of different players on your Brian Habanas, and we've talked a lot about um, Dan Carter as well. When you knew it was time to sort of transition to hang up those rugby boots, and we'll get on to your post rugby career a little bit later because that is busier than ever how tough a decision was it at that time it was but it's in the end it's not really because you you've got to set yourself up and for, for rainy days and and with uh you know everyone's got their own unique situation in life and, and families and whatever else so i i in the end you don't really see it as much of a, a decision you just sort of it's like of course what weigh it up what would you you know what's more important yeah you know so it was it's sort of yeah, so I can still play now. Like I still go. Last game I played was country footy up in uh, Northern Territory. We just ran out and had a, had a game and a little tournament, and that was bloody great fun. Before that, I was at, on the army base up in um, up in Northern Australia as well. Had a game with the boys, the Combat Engineers versus the Eight uh, Twelfth Regiment, and yeah, just random games like that out in the bush is <laughs> always good fun. Okay, we'll be back with the Honey Badger a little bit later on, but the Six Nations resumes this weekend and the pick of the fixtures is England against France. Um, Alex, where are England at the moment? Well, I think, you know, a lot's been talked about them, a lot's talked about the referee decisions, uh, captaincy, how um, they talk to the refs, etc. I I thought Wales played very well um, and I think there's a, a very high expectation for England at the moment, but Going to Millennium Stadium, very tough place to play, whether it's Ireland, England, whoever, really, really tough place. And I just think there wasn't much expectation for Wales coming to Six Nations because of what happened in the autumn and previously. And I think they're playing really well. Um, And so England got the backlash of that. But I just think they'll be disappointed. That's one game out of three, though, isn't it? You know, I mean, they lost to Scotland. Were they convincing against Italy? You know, this isn't really what we would expect from England, but as you say, they have high standards and we expect a lot more from them than other nations, maybe. Yeah, they'll be disappointed, there's no doubt about it. They don't like to lose and people, we, you know, the public, players will expect more of themselves. Um, but there's been very high standards there for a long time. Look, I, ultimately, 
the, the, the key issue at the weekend just gone was discipline you know too many penalties um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it but um, I think at the moment they're just struggling to get that momentum and consistency and and, and you know they lost lost a lot of probably momentum confidence in that first loss to Scotland and weren't their best um, I think the Italy one you know I think it's a lose-lose. You play really well. You say it's Italy. You don't play that well. People say, oh, well, you could do better. Um, and, you know, that loss to Wales was that last 15 minutes or so, they, they just let it get away from them. And I, I do think as well, they played the best attack in rugby they played at periods during that Welsh game. Um, I thought they were playing on top of Wales a lot and I thought, geez, Wales are under pressure here. But then the... To be to either lose the ball at the breakdown or a pen, give away a penalty or something silly like that, so I I did think they were building. I did think they played a lot better against Wales, um, at times than they had in the previous um two games. So I don't think they're that far away. And sure, if, and Alex, you probably know this. When they're in camp now, they won't be they won't be too worried. They'll get their discipline under control. But the way they're trying to play, I think is is from what I've seen anyway. That Welsh game is is good, and um. They're not far away. I think when it clicks with them, and it could be this, it could be this weekend. To be fair, I, I think they've been for a number of years under under Eddie, a team that are very good front runners. So they get in front through the kicking game, defence, set piece, and they build a lead. And then they put the ball in behind or in, in front of their pack. Their defence has been outstanding, and the, and they just really attack teams that way. And then as the game goes on, teams chase. And they make mistakes, and England capitalise. I think in the Scotland game they were behind and they couldn't get ahead, and it was a very close game. And the the Wales game, particularly, you know, Wales got ahead early and were in front, and England were having to chase the game, and they made too many mistakes and they gave away a few penalties trying to just push the boundaries at the end, and, and that cost them. And to and the two massive decisions, obviously, as well, like the the two wrongful decisions. So yeah. Like they're massive in, in Six Nations games, as well as what you've just said there, Alex, the discipline part of it. Yeah, I mean, let, let's be clear, they were bad decisions, but the referee's put his hand up. We've talked about that probably for too long. And, you know, that, that's big moments in Test Rugby. 14 points is, is big. So when Eddie Jones um, was asked when he first gave Owen Farrell the captaincy, why Owen, he said, to paraphrase, that he was a combative, in-your-face player and that's what you want as a captain. With hindsight, Sean, is that what you want with a captain? No, I do, I do think Owen, I think Owen is a is a great leader, um, and you do want someone that's able to have the respect of a referee and be able to challenge a referee and in the right manner, obviously. And then someone who's obviously fit and that's um, his standards are are of the highest uh, within the environment. So, like he 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 is the right man, I think, to to captain England. Him and and he has such a good group of leaders around him. Um, with other senior players there, so captain to me is just a is a, is a is a word beside beside a name. But there's there's many 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 people who within that environment I'm sure that are, um, leading and and um, directing the team the right direction. Um, so it's you know it doesn't all fall back on him either. Yeah, I think I'm glad I'm glad you said that as someone who's you know if because if I say it, it's just Saracen's bias and all that. Like I think he's a phenomenal leader. I think he sets the standards in the week, in the preparation, the lead up, how you want to train, <clears throat> which is a huge part of it. Um, and then on game day, he works unbelievably hard. He gives 100%. He, he's vocal. He's, he's just a brilliant leader in that sense. And look, Eddie likes to have an aggressive leader. He obviously had Dylan, you know, Owen is there as well. Um, but all the sort of talk about having a forward who's to be captain and stuff, it, look, Owen's vowels performances over the last what, seven or eight years seven years under Eddie or six years whatever it is have always been very consistent it's not like him having the captaincy in the last two years or so has made him go off the edge of a cliff far from it he is a very very good player he's a he's a brilliant captain for England and you know I, I think he's definitely the right man in terms of and it's interesting you mentioned Dylan you know I'm there doing post-match interviews pre-match interviews and I joke with Dylan now 
when you know he's alongside me on Channel 4 or when he's been alongside me on BBC and things you know the Dylan that you get now was very different to the Dylan that you would be interviewing pitch side at Twickenham uh, and I think maybe Eddie almost wants that in his captains he you know he they can hide behind the whole sort of like England firm as it were and they just have to go out play uh, and then England pick up the pieces and I think you sometimes maybe see that a little bit with with Owen as well I don't know Owen um, but, you know, when you see him interviewed, is that him, Alex? Is that the Owen that you know, or is that just a sort of press pub, uh, you know, persona that, that we all get? Well, I think it's pretty hard for him um, in the sense that I'll look back at when he had that ban uh, for hitting the Wasps player in, I think, September or so. It was as if three quarters of the supporters and his fans wanted him to be banned for a long time. It's like it's like he plays for England and everyone's behind him, he kicks his goals and everyone loves him. But, you know, any rest of the time, it's that people want him to fail sometimes. I feel like they want him to do badly and, and not to do well and they're like, oh, he's a dirty player, he, you know, he's not the player we want to have as our, as our captain. And you're thinking, like, what's it to be? We, you either get behind... And that's the English mentality, you know, and which I, which I don't understand, but... You should be like proud of him as a captain, of how good he is as a player, how respected he is by the other countries, the other nations. You know what a great leader he is. Um, and so, it's not a surprise that he probably puts his guard up a bit and doesn't, you know, you know, give too much in the media interviews. Um, because you know, Sean's talked with him. I'm sure, he said a similar thing. He's a good person to be around. He likes being with the lads. He he likes a joke, um, but he just doesn't let his guard down to the public that often. He doesn't. He won't put much on his social media, and so you get this kind of person who is very serious and doesn't answer too many questions, and perhaps not so you know too much flamboyance in his his media interviews. But he's a good man. He's fun to be around. The boys like to you know enjoy a drink with him or you know a good crack with him, and um, yeah, that's the person you see on the training ground. It's an interesting one, though, isn't it, in terms of, um, you know, nobody... And I've said this to um, a, a tennis player at Wimbledon before who's notoriously very difficult to interview. No one picks up a tennis racket or drives a racing car or kicks a rugby ball to be interviewed by someone like me or any of my colleagues. But that now is part and parcel um, of the game. And Sean, you know, I'm going to ask you this because there's probably pressure to subdue personalities in, in, from some quarters. Um, and then, you know, the, the public and your people on social media almost expect a personality. Is that a little bit of a balance that you've got to strike? And also maybe something that comes with being a little bit older and more comfortable in yourself and, and maybe not having the pressure of being an England captain on your shoulders. Yeah, but I think like you're, you're like when you're a captain or you're getting interviewed after a game in any context, you're protecting your team first and foremost and, and the environment and everyone that's in it um, because... Well, one is if an interview interview is um, you're after losing, it's it's going to be you're going to get some difficult questions fired at you probably, or some uncomfortable questions fired at you. But we haven't went out to lose the game, so you know what I mean. You have to you have to protect um, what you're doing every day of the week and and the people around you and your players etc. Um, you know when things are when things are good and you're winning. I think it's definitely. I think you definitely see a bit of a personality change with people in terms of they're a lot happier. Obviously, um, they can be a bit more relaxed, um, and uh, you can get a feel for their personality a little bit better. But I, I think it's. I think it's when we, we lose games as uh, people are coming after you. Then they're going, well, why did you lose that game? How did you lose the game? What was the problem in the game? And you kind of go, mm, I don't. I'm not comfortable with this yet because I'm only after playing the game. And I haven't looked back at the game, and I haven't analysed the game, so I'm not going to say something stupid here, um, you know, to get any of my team in trouble or me in trouble in terms of well, it wasn't accurate what I said, etc. Um, straight after a game, and when you win, it's kind of it's fine because you've just won the game, and that's what it's all about. Don't forget for us, is actually winning. Um, so you you get a little bit cuter with that, I think, as you get a bit older, but. You definitely have the your teammates and and the setup in the fr f in the f in the front of your mind when you're when you're doing interviews mm -hmm. and you know I don't mind personally I don't mind getting asked hard questions because you you bat them away in your own little way and what you see fit at the time um, and then when you win you kind of give people a flavour of of you know what type of person you are maybe as well with a you can be a bit more relaxed and a bit cheeky and have a smile on your face so it's um, there's a there's a, a nice balancing act to to be done with it, but it's 
it's not an easy job like um it's not an easy job to to be in that kind of environment and under the spotlight a lot especially when you're not going well when things are going great everything's fine things are going bad everything's not really fine and you have to you have to protect your your teammates and, and the setup. Well, let's stick with England, but this time move on to the Red Roses. I'm delighted to say that Mo Hunt can join us. Uh, Mo, I know you're up against it time wise because you have a very important meeting this morning, an appointment <laughs> this morning. Tell us. Yeah, so basically, um, I got one of the carpets changed like a few weeks ago, and my dad's a tradie, so like he always says, you're judged by how many cups of tea and coffee you offer. So I'm always like, do you want a tea? Do you want a coffee? Anyway, they spilt it on the newly laid carpet. So yeah, we're just coming back to try and get out the stain. So fingers crossed. <laughs> That that basically sums up uh, 2020, 2021 in a (laughs) nutshell, because these are the exciting things we look forward to. Um, Tell us how you are, though, because I know um, ups and downs at the weekend, you scored a try, I think, within 18 seconds. And then since then, yeah, you got injured later on in the match. What's the latest? Yeah, it's like pretty Jack Willis-esque. Um, so on the high, like came out of the blocks firing and then um, just in a jackal. I don't know why I'm in a jackal at 65 kilograms. I like, shouldn't have been there. Um, cleaned out from like bad angle and just my ankle got completely mangled, a little bit stuck in the floor. So just waiting to get a scan and, and go from there. But not so good. It's not looking great for the rest of the season, that's for sure. Oh, sorry to hear that. Yeah, we know we've got a delayed Six Nations yeah. as well, don't we? Which is uh, finally starting up. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute because there's, a, well, personally, I think, and I've presented it for the last six years, there are pros and cons moving away from, from the men's match as well. But there was the big news last week about the Rugby World Cup being delayed. Um, how, is, how does that sit with you? I think it's a positive like we've spent so long investing in women's rugby trying to drive it forward get the fan base in all of that sort of stuff so to have a world cup potentially with just new zealand fans or potentially behind closed Mm. doors i just don't think that it's what we're trying to do and also like you saw on the weekend george north got his hundredth cap as soon as he got asked about his family it was so teary because like you want your family and friends there for players that are playing in a world cup could potentially be the only world cup they play in like it's so awful to not be able to have crowds in your friends and family um and as amazing as it would be to go to new zealand and hopefully win it out there in front of just a stadium full of their fans like it just wouldn't be the same do you know what i mean so yeah definitely i think definitely postponement is the right thing i think it's a difficult one though because well, I look at Irish. I look at Irish setup, for instance. You have some girls there at the end of their coming to the end of their career as well. And another year, in another year, where are they going to be? Are they going to still be there? They've trained now for a year, like you have more, and put in such a massive effort and emphasis on what was going to be, what was going to lie ahead for them. But like, I, I feel, I feel kind of sad in a way because some of them mightn't be there this time next year. It is, go, it is, it is okay for younger girls and and people who've just been on the scene, but. I think this picture in a year's time will be a lot different for a lot of the teams. And because it is, it, it's another year away and a lot can happen in that year. So just from the the Irish point of view, looking at them, it's it's pretty sad that they mightn't have the same kind of uh, girls around in a year's time. But obviously the right thing to do um, for now. But um, yeah, it's, no. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult one for people. Oh, no, I completely agree. And like similar for me, like I don't know if I'll still be playing in a year's time. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's a real tough one. And also a lot of the girls, like I spoke about it the other day, but family planning, like a lot of people were looking at retiring and then having babies and stuff like that after this World Cup because there's a lot of people in my era that have been around for a long time, as you say. And it's, it is, it's a really tough one, but exactly the same thing happened to the Olympics and everyone training for that. Like it's it's the same sort of situation that we find ourselves in. And if you want it bad enough, like you'll do it and equally you could have got injured like me like I don't know if I'd make a World Cup now if it was this year so yeah it's um, a real tough one. So let's just uh, talk a little bit about the Six Nations Um, you know one thing that frustrated me when I was presenting for for BBC Women's Six Nations and Men's Six Nations is it it was an easy call if it was at the stoop in the morning or at you know, the arms park and then you could nip from one to the other and sometimes you would actually get you know, an England-Ireland match in Doncaster exactly the same time as an England-Ireland match at Twickenham. And to me, that just made no sense whatsoever. So do you think it's, uh, I mean, it has been enforced, but do you think it's positive that the the women's competition has moved away from the men's competition, even to try it? 
Yeah, massively. I, I honestly do in terms of what you just said, like rugby fans are rugby fans. So hopefully like that's the people that we're trying to get interested in watching our sport and actually stand up and take notice that we play like a decent brand of rugby. Do you know what I mean? So like we want people like that to just have a look, come and have watch a game. If it's on free to air TV, stuff like that is so important for us to be able to grow it. And as you mentioned, not only playing at the same time as men's games, but women's Six Nations historically, we've played on the same weekend at the same time as all of the other games. And it's like, if you're a women's rugby fan, like you just, you don't get a true representation of how many people want to watch. So I think it's huge in that perspective. Um, but I'm gutted that it's not a Six Nations. Like we're calling it a Six Nations, but it's not, it's, two games in a pool and then it's a final like it's not the six nations is so unique like it's an unbelievable tournament to be part of like we've all played in it it's just incredible you build through it you know everyone that you're playing against um so i think it's a real shame that it's actually taken a hit and become almost like that autumn nations cup format i think as well the lads the, the men's game can can do more for for the women's game i think the the players can do more i don't like I see it at home. I've uh, like I I I like going and watching uh, the Irish girls play, and it was absolutely class because it was such an exciting game. It was like I don't know how many tries were scored. I think there was ten or eleven tries scored in the game, but it was it was a good great game to watch. And I think we can do our bit as well in promoting that because it was actually it was an exciting game. While it was a freezing cold day, it was <laughs> it was an exciting it was an exciting to watch and. Um, the effort that goes in and and knowing some of the the girls who are playing at wasps at the minute personally the Irish girls like they 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 put so much into it and i i do think it needs to be pushed a little bit more um definitely like to to get people in there and get the support that they they, they all deserve mo as you know i presented the the first um live terrestrial women's match that has ever been on TV. But I think Sean makes a really good point because, you know, when I've been at Twickenham for an England-France match, um, which has been played after the men's England-France matches, the English boys, you know, they've got a function to go to. They walk around the pitch. The French team are told to go out and watch. Now, OK, maybe they shouldn't have to be told to go out and watch, but you do get all the guys sitting uh, in the seats at Twickenham watching, even if it's just for, you know, the first half or something. But, you know, I think that's quite powerful to see that. And, and if it's cut up on television as well, I think it's really important that um, male rugby players support the women's game as well. Oh, it's a huge statement. I think the thing that France have as well is they are all in a training venue. So they train out in Marcoussi together. So they're mm -hmm. around like the guys all of the time. So they have that bond. But whereas we're kept pretty separate to our guys, like a lot of people ask like, oh, do you ever see the guys? Do you train with them? That sort of thing. And it's just, there's no kind of communication or anything across the board um, for that. Like there's a few that definitely tweet sometimes or like they'll make a token effort but it means so much to the girls when they do and i don't think they realize the impact that they have when they do stuff like that yeah i think certainly at saracens it's been a, a big eye opener in terms of the players since the, the women have started training at, at our facility and they're there full time a lot of the time when you see them training you see how much hard work they put in and then we see them playing and the respect there was huge and i think you know, it's stuff like that for everyone to see and hang around and watch them train and watch them play. It makes a, makes a massive difference. And, you know, I can only reiterate, having watched the, the England Island game last year at the Stoop and just was so impressed with the standard. And, you know, again, seeing it live is, is the best way. And, and, you know, more and more people need to get behind it. And I guess I was going to ask as well, Mo, was, you know, what more can people do? What more can the game do to promote or sell the, the women's game, really? I think like, for, can we hold there? Sorry, they're actually at the door. Yeah, he's there. I can see you looking. I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, he's at the I'm door. Sorry. <laughs> I've got so much to say on this as well. I'll be two seconds. I'm really oh, sorry. No, she's got crutches I as love. well. This is a desperate scene. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep that in. <laughs> Okay. Did you see the fact that I've got like the most terrible shorts on, but my top's actually quite nice? I did the classic <laughs> zoom but thing. Again, that is like literally <laughs> the last 12 months in a nutshell. Um, so the carpet fitter's in, things are looking good on the house front. Um, I think you were going to answer Alex's question. Uh, yeah, so for me, like, I think Saracens and Harlequins 
um, Exeter now jumping on board and Sale to an extent have done it really well. Like I'm not slamming Gloucester, obviously they're my team, but you see, you go to their clubs, you see massive um, pictures of the girls next to the guys. Like it's a real wholesome thing and, and it makes such a statement. Like when you go to those places and you see how much buy-in there is across their social media accounts, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and it just generates like the professionalism. And I don't think it's any wonder why those teams are attracting the players that they're attracting because like there's it's just brilliant for me media has to do more like it comes from the media and when the media buy into it that's when we get more sponsorship the money starts flowing into it but at the minute i don't think you can ask for all of the sponsorship without having um a platform for it to be played on so as soon as it goes mm -hmm. on to bbc as soon as our prem games go out there more like it it's such a good um product that we're producing but I just don't think that we're like planning it well and equally similar to what you were saying earlier Lee like we're playing prem games every prem, prem sorry excuse me every prem game was broadcast last weekend yeah it was broadcast last weekend but they were all at two o'clock or kicked off at two or half two so like your women's rugby audience they can't watch it whereas across the men's like you see a Friday night game Saturday Sunday I just think that yeah. more needs to be done to be able to allow people to watch it if they want to yeah I think that's such a good point um just before you go um yesterday it was announced that there was going to be a feasibility study being carried out um on whether the women's game could support a British and Irish Lions is that something that you'd be for definitely who wouldn't want to play for the Lions like it would be epic yeah um so no I'd be hugely for it I think again it's just an amazing opportunity to be able to promote the game and bring people together and being able to play like I know a lot of the Irish girls, Scottish, Welsh players, I play with half them in the team and being able to potentially be part of something like that would just be so unbelievably special. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time. I'll let you go no, get your fine. carpet sorted. Don't give them any, n never give them any coloured drinks. Water. No, never Water. again. I blamed my dad, honestly. I was like, this is terrible. Blame your dad. Back, in, back into your t-shirt no more with the shorts. Back into yeah. your comfies. Back into your comfies. Okay, let's bring Nick back into the programme. We've just been talking about England. Um, Nick, how much rugby, if any, do you watch now since you've retired? Um, Jeez, not a lot. I, uh, I... I get out and play every now and then uh, out in country footy, but watching watching is um, if, if it's a bit if the Wallabies are, Wallabies are playing, I'll probably watch a Test match there. But that's that might be the the most of it. Yeah, oh, a couple of Western Force games. I'd love to see them. They um, they they're starting to kick back off again, which is awesome. But yeah, n not a lot, nowhere near as much as I, I used to. And why watch TV when you can be on it? And you're on it quite a bit over there, aren't you? You've got, <laughs> you've done some great stuff. Yeah, look, it's a, it's not the best mug for a uh, for TV, but um, it'll it gets the job done. Yeah, it's ent it's entertaining though. It's entertaining. I think, um, like even from your social media and hearing stories about you and stuff, like I'd be you'd be sniggering to yourself, um, looking at you. Where did you where did you get like the quick wit and the the sayings? Oh, mate, I think um, let's say being one of eight kids, you you've got to be pretty sharp when it comes to negotiating things like if you're trading a lolly uh you know for, for that footy or whatever you should do it's a constant you got to be thinking and strategizing and yeah you, you and that humor is always the way to get yourself out of trouble um so i find myself in trouble from time to time and that seems to help similar i'm i'm actually quite similar nice one alex <laughs> Oh, nice one, Alex. Is that um, your telephone voice? <laughs> Nick, I know you did SAS Australia um, whilst carrying a pretty bad shoulder injury at the same time. I mean, most people would think it was hard enough to do if you were like 100%, but you went into it, you know, battling before you'd even started. But how much of a, what kind of an experience was that? Because it seemed to humble you in a lot of ways from the clips that I saw. Well, when you when you do certain work on TV, you, you're doing a certain role, you're, you're being a certain character, and or you, you're this or you're that. But when you're on the, something like that, I, I took it pretty seriously. Like it's not a, it's, it is one of those things where you, if you do invest yourself fully into it, you will learn a lot about yourself. So when you're in lots of what, pain, physical, mental, emotional, whatever it is, what, the longer you're in there, the more. If if it you know if you can handle it, the longer you're in there, the more things you'll find out, and the more resilience you'll build, and the more understanding you'll have about your, your own limits. And so I think through that, and I, I was I was somewhat prepared through through rugby. I think there's a lot of situations in, in footy where you 
you do it, you know, grappling sessions that go for hours and, and yeah, and you, you beat, you know, you were beat two hours ago, but you're still doing it. So it's that, that mental sort of, uh, I suppose durability is, is, is what really came in uh, handy, handy there. And, and, I, and I wasn't there. I'm not there to bloody crack jokes and, and oh, I'd like to, and I, whatever else, but they are listening, you know, there's cameras everywhere and they're all like, buddy, you know, India, they're red, they, they're like recording everything you say and then they'll bring it up at some point and use it against you if, if you, you know, so you don't want to give them any ammo. You want to be the grey man, you do your job and you work hard and you shut your mouth. That's that's kind of the <laughs> what they want, you know. And was that quite, um, not tough, but you obviously said you want to have fun, you want to enjoy yourself, probably want to have a bit of banter with the people in the camp with you, but just having to be single-minded and just get on with it and just, keep trucking is was that quite tough mate it was it was there was numerous times i held myself back <laughs> i was still back from just having a bloody crack at someone or having a crack at his accent or having a crack at bloody something it was all it was all too funny it got to a point where i would just i would internalize that humor and i would have i'll try not to laugh while he's getting angry at someone or whatever else and you just hold it in and just and you bathe in that later on you know you just then you have a little track tug with yourself like go under your under your um sleeping bag and just have a good old laugh about it what's the what's the best thing you've done since you retired you obviously love your outdoors and everything that goes with it i know you've got the rogue gentleman's club and things like that but what would you say is the best thing that that you've achieved since rugby i've learned more about my identity outside of rugby has been massive for me. There's a, a lot of people and professional athletes struggle a bit when they come out of whatever it is they do because they identify as this person who plays this sport. He's, he, um, you know, he, he's this type of character, but, and, and he, you know, he's, he's, that's what everyone knows him for and expects him to do that in the public and whatever else. But you're yeah, that sort of character in that, in that scene, which is one of the scenes that's in your life. So it's a it's a quite an important thing is to is to grasp that that concept and understand more about yourself. So when you do come out of a professional environment, you can you can manage your own emotions around things. You manage your own identity and, and learn more about what you actually want, who you are. Because it's so funny, all, all your time is taken up. So you become this this and and rightfully so. That's what you want to do. That's it's, it's your passion is to be this you know, an elite athlete where you get in there, you hold your position and you and you do your best for your country and you just smash it. That's awesome. But when that finishes, then what? What, what are you? You know, so there's a, there's a big question mark. There's a void at the end. And that can be devastating for some blokes. And that's often, often you find a lot of mental health issues that arise after they've lost that bit of purpose um, and passion in their life. So for me, coming out of it, um, Realizing more about myself, going going away, going bush. You know, actually having the time and freedom to go bush by myself and learn about what what is what is in here. What, what are the deepest, darkest corners, and how can I use them now to, to direct it to a, a you know where I want to go in life? To then, you know, make money here to you know have better connections with family and friends and and, and myself. So it, that was that's probably the best achievement. That's a personal thing. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's incredible because I yeah. think we talked a lot about that as well, that a lot of athletes are almost conditioned that identity is exactly what they're doing at that time. And as soon as that stops, you almost have to start again, don't you? you yeah. people, a lot of people do get lost in that moment. So no, I think that's a, I mean, that's pretty powerful, Sean, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I think like we, we have spoke with this before and I think when you do something for such a long time and it's just... You're in that bubble and and as Nick said, it's that small part of what's one part of your life, Ruby. But when you're in the moment, you think it's everything. When you, you don't you don't really see outside the box too often. You think of bits and pieces and okay, how can I prepare myself for life after Ruby? How can I do this? What can I how can I be best prepared? But it's all about the rugby at the time when you're in there. Um and then some lads kind of let those bits and pieces slip away and when they finish then they're kind of retired and they go well what's next and like it is, it is a thing now i suppose within clubs and setups that they're encouraging younger guys to make sure they're you know thinking ahead and um thinking outside the box and it's not all about uh the rugby but um it is difficult it's, it's a difficult thing and even for me like i know i've only a year probably left or Maybe two, maybe three. Not sure yet, but um, <laughs> especially if you move to ten. Yeah, exactly. Especially <laughs> if you move in at, in, in, into ten. But 
Like it's it's it is daunting. It is daunting even for me because when you are coming to the end of it, you mm-hmm. go right. What's my next? What's my next steps here? What's my next move? And yeah. I like that part about um, going out to the bush as well, Nick. About like actually thinking about what what you're about as a person outside of rugby. That's the thing that a lot of people and fans and stuff don't really see either or don't know about. And to be honest, we probably don't know exactly um, what way we are either till we're outside of that environment. And we're and we're faced with a big wall in front of us, saying, "Right, how do we get over this?" Um, so it is. It's quite interesting. It's quite complex, and a lot of lads do suffer with it. But um, there's a lot of. I I will say one thing from the rugby side of things at the minute is that clubs, uh, unions, they they have like things in place to to help people. I suppose, yeah. um, you know, take that next step in their in their journey in life. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you. You know, you took stock of everything you'd done and you went out to the bush, as you said, and you just took your time. I think so many professional sportsmen, they just need to find that next thing straight away. It's like they finish one day playing rugby and the next day they've got to have a job, they've got to have this and everything's sorted. And I think maybe it does take a little bit of time just to sit back, you know, as you did, find you know, find yourself or understand yourself and the worst moments and the highest moments and, and take mm. stock, really. It's funny, Nick, because I love shooting. Yeah. And when I'm shooting, I don't think about anything else. So, like, it's, it's, I don't think about a thing. And I feel I'm like a different person after, to be honest. I'm completely, like, relaxed and stuff. So that's a really, that's actually something I need to actually look into now is where can I, where can I get away when I finish rugby for a couple of weeks in the bush or um, to survive off the land and have a good chat with myself? It's it's not something. On, back in the day, I was more like, yeah, but it's it's a young bloke thing, Matt. Maybe it's a it's a growing up thing where you 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 want to learn skills and you want to get ready for any like something. It just feels like you need to do. So, mate, I I, I think that's a really important thing that a lot of blokes need to do something like that. Not about going and killing things, but learning um, how to how to take care of yourself and others if if necessary. That mm. gives you that bit of that bit of confidence. That bit of um, that, that void that's missing it sort of fills that up with a with a sense of pride of, of being a man you know and, and yeah. this doesn't mean you have to yeah obviously be that that side of it. there's other ways to do that but for, for me just quickly i don't know boys but with that one you saw when i was going away i went away for a bit um in the bush i actually i got my learners on my motorbike <laughs> i bought so i bought a motorbike got my learners and then buddy put me swag on the back strapped it down and took off and then uh, I just went out, went out to the bush, out to Uluru, out the big red rock in the middle, in the middle there. And and on the mate, the journey, the, it's it wasn't where I was going. It was all the things that happened. All it was nine thousand k's round trip, and I was, went from there up to the northern northeast of Australia, up to Cairns, and then down to Sydney again. Mm. And uh, the the things you find, the people you meet, that's where I, I ran into that um, that bloke who told me the Timbuktu. Story out, but among many others. Geez, I wish I could remember the bloody things. Oh, far out! I absolutely love that story. Oh, mate, it's it's culture. It's bloody. It's it's important. We should be passing that down. Anyway, like, there's bloody there's e, there's there's emus and there's goats and there's bloody kangaroos, wallabies, there's animals and dingo, whatever it is. They're all flying across in front of the bike, and you're losing. I got attacked by a, by a mob of bloody um, emus. There's some little chicks there. I didn't see them. And the mums come flying out with these massive bloody wings and just crack. I sort of put my head to the side and it hit me on the shoulder. I knew the bike sort of slid a bit like that. And then I was just out of there. So, yeah. But yeah, just like, you know, r- roll the swag out on a mountaintop, sunset over the desert. That's the that's time when what you're saying about is this silence, because that's how you get rid of the clutter. All the all the the monkey mind, it's, it's thinking all the stresses and all that slows down. And once it's, once it's chills for a sec, you actually go, oh, it was a moment of hyper clarity where I've, I can actually think for myself of what what I am and what I want. You know, it's, it's beautiful. And Nick, before we let you go, just uh, tell us what's next for the for the Honey Badger. What you got on your radar? Got a few things coming up. I've been doing a few little uh, mini series off the grid sort of stuff about uh, adventuring, surviving crocs, you know, dingoes, whatever it is. That sort of stuff it, it is fun, but... I'm, I'm actually, uh, I want to get more into the, into the, uh, that sort of thing, but in a comedy, more comedy involved in it. So I want to do some mini series where oh, I'm in control of, of the narrative. Not, I'm not under the, you know, under the rules of a, of a big company that can't have these certain things said or these certain things done because it doesn't fit their, 
<laughs> you know, brand. Uh, uh, yeah, their brand. That's right. I, I want, want some freedom, I suppose you might say, to uh, let the dogs out. And am I right in saying? Am I right in saying you went uh, hunting uh, in Mongolia? A pretty random place to go. Yeah, mate. I was actually. It was the week before uh, the the Wallabies versus Barbarians in uh, Twickenham. It was the. It was my. That was my. That was my training. That was my preparation for that game. I, ca- I came from Japan. I flew to Mongolia, and then we what would, we met up with a, a nomad family who live. Uh, or so we fly to Ulaanbaatar, the capital. Another three-hour flight, and then a five-hour drive in a four-wheel drive over, over mountains and no roads or anything. Just yeah, and then we get to this little family who lives in the middle of nowhere. But these beautiful, and like, you know those the red like the red pink circle things on their on their cheeks, and it's just like the the yeah. documentaries that you see in the mornings. We'd we'd get up and we'd, we'd get the uh, they get the eagle out. And the, this thing is a bloody monster. It's got a, uh, it's called a golden eagle, and it's got a cap over its melon. And they take it. We get on the horseback, and we we get up these bloody mountains. And there's this, mm-hmm. you hear this, you hear this scream and scream. And then you, this uh, fox is probably about five six hundred meters down there, running out from the bottom of the mountain. And and my buddy, he's like, he's yelling at me. So I reached up, grabbed the the cap off the eagle's head, and then you, and then it just sort of, it just turned does three sixty degrees and scans. And then you've got, in four seconds, it does like a 5K radius of the whole thing, like, and ready to go. And then it just jumps off and, and down, and you hammer down, grab the fox, and, and they sort of – it's like oh, – it's more about experiencing the culture than, not, than me going hunting. You know, I, I, like, I love to see how humans do things in different parts of the world. We have no more time. So Nick, thanks so much for for coming on the show. It's been fantastic um, and all the best with everything. Good on you guys. Well, it's fair to say we've covered a pretty wide variety of topics. Um, It would be remiss, Alex, if we just, um, you know, finish this programme without mentioning Saracens. So... Do we have to, (laughs) really? I don't think it's necessary. Of course we have to. Sean, any excuse for you just to slag Saracens off, mate? Come on, let it go. Look, if you, if you saw so, the game um, against Cornish Pirates, you'll know, like, they're, if they're not the best team in Europe, you know, I, I don't know what it is. You know, three cheers for the Pirates, <laughs> if, you, if you ask me. Unbelievable side. Oh, nasty. He's. Are you playing in Japan or are you playing with Sari still? <laughs> just wondering. You're very bitter there. Uh, uh, bitter about what? I'm not bitter. <laughs> bitter about them being beaten at the weekend but no nah, like it was a tough game it was obviously um yeah i haven't spoken to many of the boys too much uh but it's disappointing to to lose first game up um on a serious note it's a pretty tough place to go and play Cornish pirates but the team will be disappointed uh and there's not so many games in this 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 league this system this year um where you can make too many uh, mistakes so i'm sure the boys have trained hard this week and, and get back on page hopefully Fingers crossed. Well, you're going to get um, going to be drafted in earlier, along with a whole lot of the other international boys that didn't really think they were going to be playing much uh, championship rugby this year. To be honest, I, I don't know. Obviously, I'm contracted out here. Um, I, I think the England boys are always going to play some games, though. Uh, but I think the good thing about the club is the boys enjoy playing for the club. They're not, you know, too aloof or you know not bothered about it, just playing for England games. Um, and you know, going away to Doncaster. Um, and Coventry and places will be different to a lot of them playing at Twickenham, but they also want to put the best foot forward for Saracens. They love the club and they want to make sure that we're back in the premiership, so they'll, they'll dig in. They want to get Yoshi to do some merchandise, create that sort of team unit again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the unity through the, the merchandise from uh, NEC Pride, NEC's Pride of uh, Yoshi, he is, uh, I think he's got 108 caps for the club, which is the equivalent of about 300 premiership caps probably. Um so he, he is the man. And as you can see, he's, man, he's put himself as a superhero. So, yeah. The Yashmeister. Fantastic. Um, gents, thank you very much. Uh, we shall do it all again next week. Thank you very much to you guys for listening, for watching, for subscribing. We'll see you next week. You've been watching The House of Rugby Season 3 on Joe.